The following presentation was recorded at the 2014 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond sponsors in 2014 for helping make these videos possible. I got my Twitter address uh, right there. If you want to make some uh, comments referencing this uh, talk, obviously using the hashtag self2014 also. Um, so uh, welcome to uh, uh, this talk on Brython. In, um, first, before uh, we start, uh, I'd like to get a feel a little bit for the audience. Um, developers, uh, people that pr do programming, Okay, um, system people, administrators, and so on and so forth. Okay, um, people in education. All right, very good. Um, just it gives me a little bit of a background. So let's let's um, go through the information first of all about me, since I've asked a little bit about you. Here are a few points about myself. So. From the accent, you probably can tell I was born elsewhere. So I'm a French Canadian and uh, currently living in the Piedmont Triad in Winston Salem. Um, I founded uh, two years ago the Python user group for the Triad. The main uh, reason for me starting that was to provide uh, a way to help in the community, um, particularly younger wants to learn programming, not uh, making it look as boring as it could be. Uh, and Python was just a good language to do that. So I started that uh, two years ago. Uh, I do a lot of uh, embedded development uh, programming and design hardware through uh, Dion Research. Uh, for the past six months, I've been doing a lot of Python programming at uh, Inmar in Winston-Salem, um, and also I write a blog uh, on the Raspberry Pi and the Python programming language. Um, some of the stuff you might have seen before, uh, I designed a Etch-a-Sketch that was controlled by a Raspberry Pi that was a fairly popular project. Um, and as far as the talk today, Brighton, uh, I'm one of the main contributors. Um, Early on, we actually were doing that fairly informally uh, as far as the, the development, and we'll get into that and what it, what it is and what it means. So Brighton was designed to basically, if I say you're going to write code for a web page on the client side, your answer would be JavaScript, right? So it's been like that for a long amount of time. But there's nothing that says that that should be the status quo. After all, if I told you that on your new computer, the only programming language you can use is assembly language or um, basic, you'd say, hey, wait a second. What about C? What about C++, Pascal, Java? What about all these other languages? Why can't I do that? Well, curiously enough, we've never asked that question when it came to the web browser. Uh, there's been some attempts over the years. Uh, but Python uh, also has been through different iterations as far as the language itself. Python 3 is the latest implementation, although Python 2.7 is very popular. As far as Brighton, it, it is uh, trying to be as complete uh, in term of compatibility with Python 3. So what it is, uh, where to get it, and some of its features, and we'll uh, do some demonstrations today. Um, and where did that name come from? Well, it is uh, a Welsh word for Breton. And the designer of Brighton is Pierre Cantel. And Pierre Cantel is not only French, but he's Breton. So that was uh, his motivation behind the name. Uh, and also, of course, it had a 
similarity with Python itself, and it's trying to be uh, a full implementation of Python. So it was uh, toward the end of 2012 uh, that uh, an announcement was made on a French mailing list, Python France. And um, um, as I saw that, I was like, oh, this guy is making stories up. I mean, that, that, can that be true? Can you actually run Python in, in the web browser? So I started looking into that, and I saw in the page there was a script type equal text slash Python. And below, of course, there was some actual Python code in the page. And the moment I saw that, I was like, okay, I, I have to participate in that uh, endeavor and this project and do something with it. So again, why Python in the browser? Well, as I mentioned, uh, on a computer, when you buy a computer, if uh, I told you you can only run this one programming language, you'd ask, why can't I install that one or this one? Right, so that was one of the reasons. Another reason is that some of the devices, uh, some of the laptops, for example, are web browser only pretty much. If we talk, think about uh, Chromebooks and things like that, we are starting to see a shift away from a full operating system on some devices or an operating system that we don't have direct access to. So it would be nice to be able to do, uh, to write some code on these things. Another reason that it's interesting is that, let's say you have a, a server and you want to scale it uh, across hundreds of clients, thousands of clients, if you have all your code running on the server, obviously you're gonna have to add more and more servers or increase the size, the capacity of the server, things like that. If you can offload some of this processing on the client side, then suddenly you have increased your scaling. And that's the whole reason for uh, applications that are using JavaScript, obviously. So the, the, the thinking is similar from that angle. Where it differs, or where there's a divergence, is that um, for those in education, you've probably noticed that JavaScript is a little harder to teach uh, than Python. If you have not tried Python, you'll, you'll see that that is the case. Um, and it, it's not a slam against JavaScript, it's just that that was not one of the design goals, whereas in the case of Python, that was the case. So these are some of the, it gives us a little bit of a background as to the reason for that. And well, there's a good amount of documentation and that's important as obviously one would like to learn about a programming language. And in this case, um, there's uh, the documentation of events, of things that are expected in a web browser and there's also just a plain uh, frequently asked questions, the syntax keywords. And so that's very important. And uh, from that angle, Brighton is fairly well documented. The documentation is available in a variety of uh, natural languages, uh, French, English, Spanish, Portuguese. Um, and so it gives people, not just in the US, but around the globe, uh, an access to the documentation to the language. And that's something that's important, obviously. And of course, I clicked, uh, there you go. Um, so in 2012 was version 1.0, uh, version 2.0 earlier this year. And that introduced really uh, some of the features. It's a little small on the font size. Let's see if I can increase that. Some of the features that were added uh, were to add some of the last pieces of functionality that were missing to have a real implementation of Python 3. Now Python 3, or Python in general, is not just the Python language itself, there's also all the libraries, and that's where some of the work has now shifted to uh, support all these different libraries. And again, uh, since this uh, presentation will be available, you can follow at your leisure. I'm not going to go into the detail 
uh, right now. Um, so where to get it? You can go to brighton.info uh, uh, or Bitbucket. There's also a link on the Brighton site to download it from Bitbucket, either in source form or an archive, so you can download it on your local machine. Or, you, uh, as I mentioned, or not, perhaps you don't want to install it. Uh, and we'll see how we can do that. So how does it work? If we think about that, a web browser only understands natively JavaScript, so how does that work? So Brighton is an engine that's actually written in JavaScript. And it, what it does is it scans the HTML document and it looks for Python code. Oh, I got some Python code. When it finds some, it will actually build a tree representing that Python code. We'll translate that to JavaScript and then we'll execute the JavaScript code that is generated from that. So obviously there's a lot more to it than than that, but that's a high level view. So just, I'll figure out, pause for a second if anybody has any questions up to now. No? Oh, go ahead. Why a new language? Okay, so Python, just to put things in perspective, has been around for quite a while. So if you look on Rosetta Code, for example, which is a comparison of all the languages, currently you'll find over 450. Good question. Apple just introduced a new language. Uh, and so, so, I mean, that's a good question. Why another one? Um, I mean, there's been new languages introduced over the years. In the case of Python, it's been around for a lot longer than people realize. It actually started gaining uh, momentum in the educational, particularly at universities, um, at least in Canada and uh, in Europe, in the early 90s. Um, and mid-90s, uh, I was developing uh, web uh, sites using uh, Python technology at that point. So it's been around for a good while. It's just that now uh, people are looking at this. Oh, I can now run this on my uh, web browser which is, this is the new uh, realm for it. And really there's uh, something that's, I would call Python anywhere. So you can buy a, a Teensy uh, microcontroller. Anybody familiar with those? It's a little bit like an Arduino. Um, it uses an Atmel or an ARM microcontroller or microprocessor. And so it's a board that's about this size. Uh, well, you can run natively um, uh, Python applications on, on that small device. So it, it scales from that all the way to uh, supercomputing cl clusters with the NVIDIA uh, acceleration of uh, uh, numerical computations through the CUDA engine. And that's all done with uh, Python syntax. So it scales a ton. So it's was just the next step to see it appear on the web browser. So. Right, so in the case of Python, when you... Oh, yes, I will definitely repeat the question. So the question was, uh, will you get a JavaScript or an actual Python error uh, trace on this. So what you'll actually get is a Python trace. It'll tell you where in the code you've made your mistake. Um, and uh, so that, that's the goal, really, that you shouldn't know that there's really JavaScript behind the scene. Just like uh, maybe you have a program that you're running, it's compiled, it might have been written in assembly language for all we know. Uh, but I shouldn't give you hex dumps of the stack, uh, in that case, I should give you errors that are uh, significant. So uh, again, yeah, it would be a, a Python type of error that you would get. Okay, so as far as deploying this, perhaps you don't want to install it, right? You might have a, a laptop where you don't have access to uh, admin rights or something like that. 
Well, you can go directly on the Brighton site and get a console. And this will allow you to put a command directly. So the simplest thing uh, is a print statement in uh, Python. And if I do hello, well, that's the most basic form of uh, interaction with a console. Uh, it returned exactly what I asked it to return. Um, so already at this level, this could be used uh, to learn the language directly. Uh, but again, since it is compatible with Python, you can also use a Python uh, interpreter. And uh, if we go back, there's also an editor. If we look at the editor, it allows us to choose our uh, colors and so on and so forth, the highlighting, we can write the code. And as we run it, then in this case, it's a test that was added, but um, I can also remove this. Again, the same thing that I did earlier. So that'd be the first step. And then in this case, I can't just hit enter, I'd have to run it. And it tells me hello on this sign. But further than that, I can actually say, well, show me the JavaScript code that corresponds to that, and it'll show me that right there. So again, up to now, I've not installed anything. I'm just running it directly in my browser. There's also uh, a Brighton Playground and PyFiddle. Both are uh, going into the same area that uh, JS Fiddle uh, goes into for JavaScript. And there's another one. Ah, little robot got lost here. Rebor Reborg's World. So André Roberge, a Canadian, um, created uh, some years back an educational program that was called Rurpol. Uh, it's actually currently distributed by a, a South Korean company uh, as a, with a book uh, to teach programming. Uh, so he decided to port this application that he had written in Python for uh, the desktop and get that running on a computer uh, through a web browser. And so Reborg's world came, uh, upon, uh, came uh, to fruition. And the way it works is, uh, if you've never seen any of these type of uh, interfaces to, for teaching uh, uh, kids in school, Basically, on one side, you have a, a grid with a little robot. And on this side, you have a way to enter commands. So it's another way to uh, teach the language, to learn about the language. So in this case, uh, there's a few commands that are already entered. One is move, one is turn left, and one is move. So if we run it step by step, we'll see it. He moved by one. He turn left and then click move again, and so he's continuing to move. So this is akin to uh, Scratch or Turtle Graphics or some of these applications that allow a visual representation of actual programming commands. Uh, so this is uh, effective for younger uh, uh, kids, obviously. Um, but the point is that, it, again, it uses uh, bright on for uh, evaluating the Python code here. So all of these uh, different modules or applications that are using the, the bright on interpreter and its modules allow for zero install. So this can run on anything ranging from a Chromebook to Whatever, any, any computer that has a web browser will be able to execute these things. So the next step is that you can actually get the code and run it locally on your computer. And so you'll still access it through uh, your web browser, but it will no longer be hosted on the Brighton site or any of the other sites. Uh, it'll be uh, hosted locally. And that's interesting and important that it is available like that because it allows uh, a wide range of other applications beside what I've mentioned up to now. Now, I've mentioned the, uh, in this list here the ABC of a local instance. 
I'm going to change this font size here so we can see. Is it readable? Okay. Uh, it's a yeah. So it's a little hard. So, but uh, basically, it includes uh, the JavaScript engine, which is bright on itself, and it. It mentions source equal code.py. This is where the code will be residing. And it says body on load equals bright on. So what it says to the web browser is the moment you're done loading the page, execute the bright on engine. So bright on can look for Python code and do its thing. And that's basically all that is really needed on a web page, any web page, be it a blog or a uh, full-fledged application, that's the, on, the only amount of code that one needs to write uh, from that perspective to be able to link to actual Python code. Um, since um, we have a limited amount of time, I won't go into all the details of the different local instances. Uh, and I'll mention also that one can uh, run that from a server. So perhaps you have your own server or you could have a blog uh, what I've done in my case is I've included in my uh, Raspberry, Python, Raspberry Pi Python blog a way to have some interaction on creating an application. Well, in this case, it's not just an application. It's actually hardware, electronics. So it's a breadboard. If you've ever seen, uh, if you go to Radio Shack, you'll probably see one of those. Uh, it's a little uh, a plate that allows you to put components, electronic components. And that's used in school also to teach basic electronics. Uh, in this case, it's explaining how to make uh, a bridge for a motor to be able to reverse directions. And instead of just reading the textual description of how to do that, if uh, I click, it says put four resistors of value 660 ohms uh, in specific position. And if you click show me, then they are applied to the breadboard in this case. And all of that is written in Python, which is really bright on that's running that in the browser. And so if I continue, I put transistors, wires, wires, and the motor and I would have a functional uh, application for controlling a motor to go in two directions. So these are some of the applications that can be done on a server like that. If I go back here. Uh, it can be hosted on, even on Dropbox or GitHub or Bitbucket or any host that uh, will allow running Python or a full shell account. Uh, you could have an Amazon Web Service account or something like that. And then the last one I wanted to mention is um, a different type of application that is a server, but at the same time, it's not a server that you uh, that's situated in the data center. It's called Bruce. Bruce is a project that I started uh, some months back to provide in remote locations uh, a way to have infrastructures to hold a classroom. So a portable classroom infrastructure, in other words. And so that is what it looks like. It's, uh, if you've been to uh, an earlier presentation today on the Raspberry Pi, you'll recognize that there's a little Raspberry Pi computer here, an antenna for the wireless network, and a big uh, battery pack that will allow me to run this from early morning till late at night uh, without skipping a beat. And that's uh, fairly important if you're in remote areas that have fluctuating power, uh, that have uh, perhaps uh, dirty power, uh, power that actually can damage computer equipment. Um, and uh, so one of these is used in, uh, in uh, nearby Rio de Janeiro. 
uh, in Brazil in order to provide a portable classroom access. So if I go here briefly to my wireless access, And there you go, it just showed up, Bruce here, which is French, by the way, for uh, bush or field. So as uh, you can imagine, a classroom out in a remote location, uh, hence the name. Uh, so I just connected to this uh, instance, the, the, the uh, uh, access point. So my laptop is now accessing uh, the portable infrastructure. And then if I go to free class, well, uh, of course, uh, I don't have a login, but if I do this, so I'm bypassing the login here right now, but um, I'm actually getting a portable copy of the whole Brighton site. And I can do that also with uh, the Reborg uh, robot or whatever. Uh, there's uh, different applications that can be uh, put into a lo local portable instance like that. The advantage of that is that you're self-contained. You don't need internet access. So if you're in an area there's no internet access, you can still have your classroom uh, going in that regard. Okay, so let me just go back to the wireless network for this facility. And we're back. So it can also be used with frameworks for those that do development uh, with uh, actual uh, Python frameworks uh, or not just Python framework, it could be web development frameworks, it's fairly easy to interact uh, with uh, Brighton in this manner. So, okay, a secondary pause at this point for a few quick questions, if there are any. No, you're good? Following along? Oh, go ahead. Yes. So how to handle imports. So in Python, there's this concept of uh, um, you have this set of keywords that you can use. And it does a lot of stuff. But sometimes you need a little bit more. And these are what are called modules in Python, or akin to libraries, uh, basically a collection of functions or methods or classes and so on and so forth that are importable. Uh, to be used by the program. Now, it's a good question because if you think about it, I'm running on the browser. So if I'm importing, where is it coming from? Right? It would have to come from another source. And the problem there is that uh, browsers are uh, by default blocking access to other than the main site that you're accessing when it comes to JavaScript. So it creates some challenges. One of, one of the way to work around that is to host on the server, like for example on this little device here that I have, I have not only the Brighton interpreter, but I got all the libraries that I will need on here. There's also a way to uh, uh, use a distribution so th there's a, a build that is done regularly of Brighton, and it actually collects all the different uh, modules and create one file. So you have only one JavaScript file to import initially, to include in your HTML, and it will load all the stuff that you need. Obviously, that will be a fairly heavy uh, file at that level, but uh, again, it's a question of uh, uh, ease of use versus complexity uh, as far as that. But that, that was a pretty good question. All righty. So now, if we look at uh, 
delving deeper. So any are front end web developers here? Okay, well I guess we're a little bit. So uh, I'll just do a quick mention that actually as of the current version, there's a very nice uh, interaction between Brighton and JavaScript libraries. And that's important because the JavaScript ecosystem is uh, well established, it's been there for a long time and many people are used to these uh, libraries so it would be nice to be able to play along with these and it is the case. So that helps in many ways uh, and it was not the case initially. Uh, initially uh, you have to set your priority as to where the development goes and uh, initially the core was to support uh, Python 3 and then all these other things w would come later and uh, so now it, uh, it's actually fairly easy to interact between JavaScript library and Brighton and it doesn't pollute the whole namespace and so on and so forth so you can do that. Uh, for those that are just curious or would like to contribute uh, there's a Bitbucket uh, site uh, if you search for Brighton and it's under uh, Olemis slash Brighton on the Bitbucket site and the source code is available there. Uh, again, since this uh, presentation will be uh, made available, um, you'll be able to do that at a later time. It talks about also on that Bitbucket site, it, may, it has a link to how to make web apps for Firefox OS. Uh, also for uh, some uh, of the videos that are on Brighton and so on and so forth. So there's training material also uh, on that website. Oh, I hate when that happens. Okay, so some of the possibilities. If we look at the gallery first of the Right on. Let's do it in English here. So some of the things that you can do, for example, uh, obviously um, you can do e fairly easily pie charts. And if you right click on any of the pages when you go through the demos, the gallery, and all that, you'll see the whole source code in uh, in clear. So. But if we look, let me see if we have some. There's some that are actually designed to run on mobile apps. This is actually a compass that you can run on your portable device. Uh, and it uses the actual uh, uh, pointing of the, the device. So if you're on an iPhone or a, a Galaxy phone or whatever, you could actually move around and you'll see it'll always point to the north. So, and it's all done in Python thanks to Brighton and its integration with the DOM or the domain of object model of the web browser. Let's see, um, you can do very different things. Uh, how about uh, Russian or Cyrillic characters? You can do that. Interacting here. Um, even little 3D applications where you can actually go and navigate a maze and so on and so forth. We won't go through all of them, but uh, there's quite a bit of example and code that you can look at to uh, get a good feel for how to do these things. All right. And Yeah, sometimes, oh, okay. Sometimes external links are. Um, so there's even a little platform for creating educational games. Uh, there's a, basically a framework there and uh, you can 
uh, get that on your local machine and uh, modify it to suit your own uh, application. No. So there's a lot of these modules that are fairly involved, fairly complex. A lot of them require actual native C uh, libraries to run. So if you're thinking like NumPy and SciPy and PyGame are some of those that require compiling code uh, to be able to give Python access to some of the uh, acceleration uh, or features of the hardware from that perspective. So that, at this point, is not available. Um, it doesn't mean that it will never be. Uh, but uh, short term, I don't see that uh, happening from that perspective. However, there's uh, a lot of, um, it's very easy to manipulate SVGs, which are vector graphics on your web browser, which allows you to do uh, games fairly easily uh, that allows you to do charting, graphs, and things of that nature. Um, there's also a good support for all the HTML5 uh, tags. Uh, again, um, it makes for a fairly easy uh, process to uh, migrate from if you've had experience doing web pages uh, with JavaScript to doing them with Python. Again, it's not necessarily the main focus of the project. The project is to give an option, uh, and sometimes it makes sense, sometimes it doesn't. However, as far as games are concerned, uh, there was a good uh, article that was posted um, not too long ago uh, that mentioned that a lot of the games are moving toward a web-based uh, uh, scenario. And Python has been um, historically used quite a bit to do a lot of these uh, massively uh, uh, basically large environments where you can have uh, many players uh, at the same time. Uh, so it, I think it's a good fit from that perspective. So it's not just in the education field. Uh, in the game field, I think we'll see a bit more of that. Um, in technical fields also, uh, there's quite a bit of uh, potential there. Uh, so, all right. So again, as far as on what's on the radar in the near future, adding more modules, and so on and so forth. If we go back to, for example, the Brighton website, and if I go on the console, and that will uh, hint as to also what happens when it comes to um, doing imports. So I can do import. Uh, actually, that was one of the first external modules that I implemented, and mostly for talks like this one or in the classroom, import anti-gravity. And just like in Python, if you type that, you end up on this web page of XKCD about Python, where it's asking, you're flying how Python? And it continues on to say, I learned it last night. Everything is so simple. Hello world is just print hello world. The reply back, I don't know. Dynamic typing, white space? The reply, come join us. Pro programming is fun again. It's a whole new world up here. But how are you flying? I just typed import anti-gravity. That's it? I also sampled everything in the Midsen cabinet for comparison, but I think it is the Python. So, <laughs> so it's uh, one of those uh, hidden uh, things uh, in Python. There's quite a few of those, but I, I thought it would be kind of fun to uh, just do that. So I've implemented a few of these uh, basic um, modules that some are functional and very useful, and some are, I guess, uh, at least useful for um, presentations such as this one. All right, so as far as in conclusion, um, Brighton 
is fast enough. It's not the fastest. I mean, if you write pure JavaScript, it's going to be faster. But the same has been said about Python itself. Uh, from the early days, people were, were saying, Python is way too slow. I can write this in assembly language, and it's going to be x times faster. Or I can write this in pure C, it's going to be y times faster. Why bother with Python? Well, Python allows you to write code that uh, is more concise, more to the point, and more readable. Now, if uh, you've ever had to read somebody else's code before and wondering why they did this or that this way and that way, Python uh, dictates some of this will force you to do certain things a certain way, which is good because I'm going to write the code like this. You will write the code like that if I don't give you any direction. But if we all are following the same thing, we will all have the same approach, roughly. Or at least it will look the same. The alignment will be the same. The parentheses will be where you'd expect them to be, so on and so forth. This allows for visually an easier time to read the code. And that's what makes Python, in general, easier to use. Uh, well, that's what makes Brighton also easier to use in certain areas. Uh, again, the speed, it's not just the speed of execution. The speed of coding, the speed of debugging, that all has to be factored in into the whole approach. So mobile support. Uh, I mentioned, for example, accelerometers and battery levels and GPS and so on and so forth. I uh, wrote a few uh, little applications that run on my iPhone uh, that uh, allows me to uh, track GPS. I wrote the, the code, put it on my blog so people could see how do you do that. It's not very difficult at all. It's a few lines of code. And people are like, OK, where's the rest of the code? No, that's it. And uh, so that, that's really the target audience uh, for this, is people that want to write applications that are not too complicated, not too simple, but they want to be able to code that fairly quickly uh, in, in a language that's easy to read. So, and I think uh, my last point was an up and coming community. So there's support in many languages. The forum is fairly responsive. Uh, even during the World Cup, uh, while, <laughs> while uh, Brazil was uh, playing Mexico, and uh, we had a bug report from a Brazilian, I was like, wow. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> and so we, we addressed that. But uh, so it, it just shows that, uh, again, the community is, uh, is there to support it. And it's international, which is important when uh, it comes to uh, projects like that. And again, I'm really excited, excited to see that used in, uh, um, in the field in, uh, in uh, Africa, in Cote d'Ivoire, and uh, also in uh, uh, Brazil, uh, in areas where they don't have uh, easy access to power or internet. So, so that's pretty much it, uh, unless somebody has a Another question uh, to conclude on this here. All right. Well, I appreciate your time. If you have any other questions, my email and my Twitter handle right there. And um, uh, if you're interested in knowing about your local Python user group uh, also, uh, just uh, let me know. I'll uh, find uh, one that's close to you. Uh, to help you getting started. All right, thank you.
Your customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up.